Okay. So let me just. So there is a sutta, it's called the Kosambian Sutta, that there was a bunch of monks that were fighting. Anyway, these monks just kept quarreling and brawling and calling each other uh, names and causing just general havoc. As the Buddha decided he didn't want to be around those monks anymore, he gave a discourse while he was standing. And then he wore the glass. Was that if there are seven different things that you do, you can become a sotapanna with fruition. The first thing is uh, Is there any obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know and see things as they actually are? Now, this is a real interesting thing because we all get obsessed with the way things are supposed to be, the way we want them and we hold on to them so tightly that we just cause ourselves infinite amounts of suffering. So we need to be able to recognize when we are obsessed, when we are holding on so tightly. We need to use the six R's. We need to change our perspective of things. I always get a cup of a, a laugh with people, especially if they're married and they start complaining about each other and they become obsessed. And they start saying things like, she always does that. He always says that. And what is that talking about? That's talking about an obsession. And nobody always does anything in exactly the same way. So if we learn to change our perspective of things and learn to listen with new ears to whatever is being said, we will become a lot happier and not so obsessed by thinking things are always gonna stay the same. You also become obsessed with five hindrances whenever they arise and they take your attention away. If you're obsessed with greedy mind, obsessed with dissatisfaction mind, obsessed with lazy mind, obsessed with restless mind, or obsessed with doubt, if you get obsessed by any one of these things, that is the cause of your suffering. And you not only suffer, but you make other people around you suffer. So it's a real important thing to remind yourself to let go of all kinds of obsession. Your mind is obsessed. It is obsessed in speculation. It's obsessed in all kinds of 
perspectives that don't necessarily aren't necessarily true. If there is no obsession that is, if there's no obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I shall, I cannot know and see things as they actually are, my mind will be well disposed and awakened to the truths. This is the first knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Now you become super mundane when you begin to have skill in getting into one of the jhanas. You become super mundane the more you practice wholesome, uplifting thoughts. You're not an ordinary person when you are practicing these uplifting things and you cultivate this kind of view. He understands thus, when I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, I personally obtain serenity. I personally obtain quenching. This is the second view obtained by him that leads to a serenity and quietness. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who is possessed of right view? What is right view? Right view is always seeing the impersonal nature of everything, not getting caught up in the I, me, mind idea. Not trying to control your mind and try to make your mind be the way it's, you think it should be. The more you practice the six R's with your daily activities, the more equanimity you will develop the more happiness you will experience. The lighter your mind will become. So this is really important for having a mind that is alert. A mind that is balanced, a mind that has more happiness in it, a mind that has more joy in it. Now, one of the things I was hearing Sister Kama talk about that is real important to understand because I know that there's a lot of people that are teaching a kind of meditation where your mind is really, really strict and you're supposed to only have this kind of thought. But it's not natural. It becomes natural when you're practicing the six R's, when you're using forgiveness, when you're using gratitude when you're more uplifted, when you're more alert with your mindfulness. Now, 
Now, again, we're moving some importance into the steps. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, is there any other recluse or Brahmin outside of the Buddha's dispensation possessed of such a view as I possess? He understands there are no other recluses or Brahmins outside the, the Buddha's dispensation, possessed of a right view, such as I possess. This is the third true knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who possesses the right view? This character of a person who possesses right view. Although he may commit some kind of offense for which a means of rehabilitation has been laid down. Still, he at once confesses, reveals, and, and uh, talks, discloses it to the teacher or a wise companion in the holy life. I was talking about if you become a Sotapanna or a Sakadogami, you can still make a mistake and, and break a precept. Now, the thing is, when you break a precept and you have become uplifted, you are going to feel very, very guilty. And it will bother you a lot you broke the precept. So what you need to do is go to the teacher or go to a, a friend that is a, a spiritual friend. Confess that you broke the precept. I said, so I was talking about the precepts. The real problem that we wind up having in our daily life is that we don't really take the precepts as seriously and why. It's only, it's just a little lie. Okay, it's just a little teeny thing. It's nothing. But it causes you to have a guilty mind. And that guilty mind always manifests itself as a hindrance. And that slows down your progress in the meditation. So you need to be able to be close to someone and tell them when you break a precept. One of the definitions of an arahat is an arahat is a person that has no secrets. Now, when you break a precept, you have a secret. And you want to keep it to yourself. But that slows down your progress more than a little bit. Say something that's not true. Take something that's not given. All of these things that you can do and break the precept and justify it and say, well, it's only this little thing. It's not a big deal. Actually, it is a very big thing. 
and it's something that you need to be more careful with. And you confess that to a teacher or a, a, a spiritual friend and make a determination. I will not break a precept again. So this is absolutely important. So he enters upon the restraint for the, for the future. And having done that, he enters He enters upon restraint for breaking the precepts. He understands thus, I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. This, this opens up your mind a lot. And the more clear you become with keeping the precepts without breaking them. The more clear you become doing that, the easier all life becomes and life becomes much more fun, more at ease. And you won't get fooled by people who try to break the precepts and take advantage of you. You will be able to see that and not get involved with that. So it's a real important thing to keep your precepts without breaking them. And that means you are a person who possesses right view. This is the fourth true knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane. Not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. He may be active in various matters for his companions in the holy life, yet he has a keen regard for training in the higher virtue training in the higher mind, training in the higher wisdom. Just as that is the character of a person who possesses right view. What does it mean, the higher virtue? Keeping your precepts. What does it mean, training in the higher mind? Training with sitting in meditation and being able to recognize the different jhanas when you attain them. Training in the higher wisdom. Training in the higher wisdom means understanding exactly how dependent origination works, how the three characteristics work, how the five aggregates work, how every, everything that the Buddha teaches us that is interconnected, that is the training in the higher wisdom. Just as a cow with a new calf, while she grazes, watches her calf. So too, that is the character of a person who possesses right view.
Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Buddha is being taught, he needs to heed it, give it attention. That means don't be thinking about this or that, but really pay atten attention, give ear. The closer you actually understand and see the importance of the Buddha's teaching, the more easily you will be able to become a Sotapanna. So you, you give ear. You en engage in, you engage the truth with all of your mind. You hear the Dhamma and discipline with eager ears. He understands I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the strength or this is the sixth knowledge attained by, by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Buddha is being taught, he gains inspiration in the meaning gains inspiration. Oh, I just lost my place. Uh, it gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains gladness connected with the Dhamma. He understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the seventh knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of these seven factors, he has well sought the character for realization of the fruit of stream entry. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, he possesses the fruit of stream entry. And that's what it's, the, the Buddha said, you, can, you don't necessarily need to be sitting in meditation only to attain uh, becoming a, a Sotopana or a Sakadagami. You can become either one of those when you are paying attention closely to what the Buddha is saying and understand what he is teaching and have gladness and have joy in your mind while you're learning these things. 
when you are when you were young and you were in school you had a favorite class of course you paid closer attention because you really understood what that class was all about right and the, the more fun you had learning whatever that class was, the more fun you had, the better the grade is that you got. And the deeper you understand. That's what this sutta is all about. It's about paying close attention to what the Buddha is teaching you and how to truly understand what is being taught and do this with a happy mind an uplifted mind so be very attentive anytime you hear a dhamma talk don't be judgmental while you're listening to the dhamma talk don't don't be criticizing in your mind, oh, that's not what the Buddha taught. Listen attentively all the, all the way through it and then compare that that you heard in the Dhamma talk with your, your book of suttas and see if it agrees with it or not. you will begin to be more and more clear about what the Buddha's teaching is and how to actually practice it. Because this is not just a sitting meditation and then forget about it for the rest of the day and go do whatever you're gonna do. If you start realizing the importance of what's being said right now and you let go of your obsessions. You let go of your distractions. You change your perspective of everything that's being said to you and by you. Then you will begin to truly follow the Dhamma. Oh. You know? Supporter after. You can go on for 15 minutes, Monday. Well, I've said about everything that I wanted to say tonight. Do you have any questions for me? If anybody has questions, please uh, put it on the chat or uh, ask directly. Yes, please ask the question. Come on, Ardika, you always ask questions. Come on. Bante, <laughs> I do have a question, Bante. It's okay. Brenda. Yeah. Um. One of my one of the friends here. I was asking about the ignorance, Avijja. Yeah. Uh. Upon reading the Majima Nikaya number one, is it possible that Avijja is also can be understood as misunderstanding? Well, Avijja can be understood as misunderstanding. Yes. Ignorance means not completely understanding. That's the actual meaning of ignorance. Mm -hmm. And when you don't completely understand how important the Four Noble Truths are, if you aren't following, keeping the six R's and go into more wholesome, uplifting kinds of things, then you are being ignorant. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
ignorant, a lot of people, they, they have this idea that ignorance means stupid, and it's not. That's not right. the definition of it. It is a, def, that is a definition of not un, completely understanding or deeply understanding. Okay. Thank you, Bante. Okay. Thank you. Bante, do you want me to read one of the questions which has come in the chat room? Yes. Uh, there is one question saying that uh, can we explain the word Shankara other than mental accumulation? Shankara has so many different definitions, it's remarkable. One of the things, it, it depends if you're looking at it as formations, it's mind, uh, body, speech, and mind. It's the potential for those things to arise. Uh, Venerable Jnananda, he gives it the definition of preparations. And I, I very much like that because that, that is the potential for body, speech, and mind to arise. It's there. That potential is always there as long as you're alive. The thing that you want to be uh, more clear with is not just a word like that, but also the reality of the dependent origination that it's, it, it's starting. It's the, the potential for body, speech, and mind to happen more and more. And it, it's uh, a lot of uh, well, the words are not coming to me right now. We'll just call it the potential. The preparations for things to arise. Go ahead. The second question is obsession. What are some of the signposts that indicate one is maybe obsessed with this or that? And is this obsession behavior distinct from habitual tendency? Well, that's really easy and it's one word. Craving. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's taking it personally, liking and disliking, getting caught up in your opinions, your ideas, and just generally causing yourself suffering. That's what obsession is. Okay. <laughs> is there any of the else who has a question? Please uh, ask directly. What is the true consciousness? True vinnana. Vinnana. What is vinnana? I am not satisfied with the consciousness. What is real vinnana? Vinnana. Real vinnana. Vinnana means feeling. Uh, Pante, that's vidana. Vinnana is consciousness. Oh, excuse me, I got it mixed up with it. Vijnana and Cheta basically are the same thing. I've gone around to a lot of major teachers to try to find out the difference between the two and they've never given me any kind of satisfactory answer. Why, what are you looking for with that word? What are you so, trying to find out? Actually, what I get that feeling during meditation at higher levels. Well, it's being aware of awareness itself. Yes. 
It's part of wisdom's eye. Wisdom's eye. Now remember, wisdom is always the links of dependent origination. Wisdom's eye is observing how this process actually works. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when Dante Vandami, uh, this is Praveen Taide from uh, Pune, India. Uh, Bante, I have a question about uh, my personal experience about meditating. Uh, from last nine to ten months, uh, I am trying to meditate. When I first time meditate in ten day course at uh, VRI, uh, Research Institute of India, I could uh, feel that while uh, meditating, I feel tremendous pain at my forehead center. And during the 10 days of course, that at the end of the course, I could realize that it become a habit. Nowadays, yeah. from, from last seven months, when I try to sit and focus for uh, an hour or two, I get that feeling so instinct that it creates a waviness effect in my mind all over. Of course. Even though my, even though my, my body, my mind, my whole body is focused, I could feel the actual feel for uh, a free fall in my body from head to feet and yeah. okay head to feet. Let, let me let me give you an answer for that one yeah please trying too hard you're pushing too hard exactly yes okay so how do you not push so hard smile okay and I mean smile all the time. That causes that tension and tightness when you use the six R's and you relax and smile. You stop trying so hard. Your mind becomes much more clear and the pain will fade away by itself. Anytime you push and try to make your mind be the way you want it to be, that is the cause of that tension and tightness, that suffering. So what you need to do is just smile into it and don't try to make your mind be a particular way. You're trying to focus too intensely at one time. You need to back off. The more you relax, the more you smile, the easier it is to stay with your object of meditation and the less tension and tightness you will experience. I promise. Okay. Uh, Bhante, uh, one more question related to the same thing. Uh, okay. I could I could focus like my mind. I could focus my mind. I could feel the sensation. I could feel them from head to toe. But how to maintain the equanimity? Because I what I understood is unless equanimity in in, in your mind, the the sankhara cannot be go away or cannot lift away. So my question yeah. is how to um, maintain the equanimity? How to uh, be in a state where equanimity will be increased. Patience. Patience leads to Nibbana. You're trying to get everything all at the same time. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> Relax, smile. If you want to really progress fast, you use the six R's without trying to cause your mind tightness at any time. Okay. You're not being patient with yourself when you're trying to demand and control, and that causes a lot of suffering. So please let that go. Politely smile. 
I want you to take a full day and do nothing but smile. And when you see you're not smiling, smile again. And if you don't feel like smiling, laugh. As odd as it sounds, I want you to do it for a full day. And then at the end of the day, I want you to sit down for just a half an hour and smile and use the six R's with your meditation. You'll see a big change. Okay. Thank you so much, Bhante. Thank you so much. Okay. Sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. Anybody else? I think we can end one day now. Okay. Um, so, yeah. One last question, Bhante. Okay. So actually, um, I was trying to find out what's the difference between um, what we're doing, the Samatha Vipassana, and those people who actually try to, you know, mix up the Samatha and Vipassana, even though they're actually focusing on something, and we are not focusing on something. So they... Well, they are they, doing they, a one-pointed concentration. Okay. And, and then... Right. We're, do we're, we're doing an awareness kind of practice where we learn how mind's attention actually works. But when you're practicing one pointed concentration, you're over focusing. That's what the, the person right before me was doing. He was over-focusing and trying to push his mind to be the way that he thinks it's supposed to. But what I'm showing you is a much softer, gentler, more open, clear sure. of awareness. Okay? And you also okay. You said with this measurement of progress, you didn't try it at 2810. Yeah. You're trying to uh, uh, comprehend the Dhamma and make the progress in the meditation. That well, is yeah, of course. Sure. You, you are comprehending the Dhamma when you focus this way. When you over focus, that stops you from understanding the Dhamma. Well, you just go in a different, a different path. Okay. Okay, Bhante. Okay, so let's share some merit.